everybody. We will be hosting tonight talking about emerald ash borer and its effect, it's what it means as a, as a homeowner, as a landowner. And uh, we're gonna take your questions in the chat box. We ask everybody to remain muted so that um, we don't have the background noise. Uh, when Russ first got on, he had some dogs barking. <laughs> it was pretty funny. So we can see why we need everybody to mute. Uh, so thank you very much for doing that. Um, they, if you don't figure out the chat box and you wanna you know, have a question, you know, wave your hands, wave your arm, and we'll see if we can get your question that way. I'm gonna turn it over. Um, our speakers tonight are um, Russ Barrett from the Northfield Conservation Commission. We have David Paganelli, who's the Orange County Forester, and Joanne Garten for Urban from Urban and Community Forestry Program. And so they're gonna share with us their knowledge on this crazy little insect and uh, our forests and ash trees. And uh, I'm expecting all of us will learn a lot and have a good hour together. And then we'll let you get on with your evening. Russ, why don't you take it away? Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, as Lisa said, I'm Russ Barrett. I'm a member of the Northfield Conservation Commission and tree warden here in Northfield. Uh, tonight's forum is part of a uh, grant the town received, uh, one to help financially and document the removal of, ash, of priority ash trees on town roads and power right of ways, and two to provide information, education uh, concerning EAP for homeowners and landowners so they might mitigate the cost and environmental damage caused by EAB. I'd like to thank Debbie Zawaro and Ruth Rutenberg uh, for putting together the grant that was awarded by Forest Park and Recreation. And thank you, Lisa and Vermont Coberts for providing the virtual site and helping to publicize the forum uh, for us. I'll go over quick to tonight's speakers and, and, proc and about what they're gonna talk about. Uh, Joanne Gordon with Urban Community Forestry, um, Forest Parks and Recreation. Uh, she will provide basic information about EAB, uh, some tips on ash tree identification and management of EAB in Vermont now. Then I'll give a little spiel on um, uh, and provide some EAB guidance for homeowners and the general public. And Dave K. Paganelli, uh, Orange County Forester, uh, will talk about EAB and woodlight management and give a reminder of the uh, UVA requirements for people who enrolled in that program. Um, with that, Joanne, uh, why don't you go ahead and start us off. Thanks, Russ. Um, great to see you all and see that you're all here. Some of you I know in other capacities, so it's great to see you as Northfield people. Hi, Tim. <laughs> and, um, this is um, great for, for me to, to meet some of you. I um, live in Montpelier and pre-COVID our office was in Montpelier also. Um, I work for the Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is a partnership between Vermont Forest Parks and Rec, where I work, and UVM Extension. And we talk about all kinds of community trees, um, but in these last few years, we sure have been talking about ash trees quite a lot because of emerald ash borer. So, um, what I'm going to do in the next 10 to 15 minutes is walk you through something that would normally take maybe two and a half hours and uh, we'll, we'll condense it down. Just know that if you have questions, we have lots of resources in our program, Urban Community Forestry Program, um, both people and online resources, you know, things to read, videos to watch. So please get hold of me afterwards with other questions because we definitely can't cover it all today. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, and hopefully you are seeing a slideshow with a bunch of fall looking ash trees. Uh, maybe Dave or Russ, you could give me a thumbs up if that's what you're seeing on your screen. That is what we're seeing. Great. Um, so again, this is the super condensed version to talk a little bit about emerald ash borer, which is an invasive forest pest native to Southeast Asia that turned up in Vermont probably many years, more years ago than we know, um, but was first confirmed in the winter of 2018. Yeah, actually the first, conserva um, first confirmed infestation was in central Vermont. 
And as a program, we've been talking for a couple of years about how to prepare for the decline of ash trees due to emerald ash borer. It has certainly been in all our surrounding states and provinces um, for many years. And it was really a case of um, when, not if, emerald ash borer would show up. So um, what I'll do is talk um, a little bit about ash trees and, and the insect itself, and then where we stand right now with emerald ash borer um, known infestations in the state and how it's being managed. Um, here's a couple of, of web addresses and I'm going to package this up as a PDF to send out to, um, probably to Lisa, I guess, to pass on to all of you. Um, but just know that our, our two main uh, resources are this Vermont Invasives, vtinvasives.org, um, which has information about all kinds of invasive plants and pests, but emerald ash borer is one of them and it's highlighted there on that page to get the most current information about EAB, as we call it in Vermont. And then the second main website, vtcommunityforestry.org, which is our program website and provides a lot of information about municipal preparedness. Um, so you may be thinking about ash trees on your land, but there's also an element of ash trees in your community, along your roads and your public ways and places. So before we get into talking about EAB that may or may not look something like this, um, we need to figure out first what ash trees look like um, and there are many, many tricks and, and ways to tell what, I'm just enlarging my screen so I can see you. It's nice to know that there's people out there. All right, great. Um, ways to identify ash trees. And if you're feeling like um, ash trees, no problem, we split them for firewood all the time. I know what these look like, then great. You're in a good spot to help out in your town and help out your neighbors. But if you feel like you, um, know what a maple is and that's about it, then we're gonna look at a few different ways to identify an ash tree, but definitely the best way, like anything in nature, is to go out and um, take a peek. It's a pretty common ash tree, a pretty common tree in our Vermont forest. So here's a couple examples of ash trees standing on their own, just so you start to look at the form. Um, in the, on the summer on the left and in the fall, you get these brilliant yellow colors and sometimes quite purple in the fall. And we won't be seeing those now. So the key to think about is really the form of the ash tree. This is a bit more how we'll be seeing it um, over the winter. And many people feel that they can't identify a tree without the leaves. But in fact, uh, strangely, I think ash trees are a little more easy to identify without the leaves. So um, a couple of things you want to look for in that to identify an ash tree is first and foremost this um, opposite branching. So hopefully you're seeing a close up of a couple of ash tree branches here. Um, all plants and trees have either opposite branching where they come off um, com exactly opposite each other or alternate where they switch going down the stems. And ash trees are one of our opposite branching. So step one, note that this is a, an opposite branching tree. I do want you to take a look. Uh, let's see if I can find a good one. I'm going to Just gonna move my circle here before we go back to the slideshow. Um, where is one? Here's one. Here you can see kind of a, a, an opposite branched ash tree that's missing its opposite. Um, definitely as you look up at ash trees and try to identify them, know that things happen, squirrels, ice, rain, and sometimes the opposite partner can fall off. So be sure to look all around the ash tree for its, for its partner there. Um, in opposite branching. Bark is another telltale sign. This is a bark of a mature ash tree. Often the immature ash trees can look a lot, a lot smoother, but they have this diamond shape to them. Um, and when you sort of, when you touch them, they're a little bit spongy um, compared to other, other types of trees. But really that, that furrowed and diamond shaped bark is pretty characteristic of both white ash and, and, and green ash. Um, black ash can look a little bit different and that's sort of worthy of its own discussion, but the form up looking up to the canopy is still the same. These opposite branches that are very stout, you know, going back to this slide, another common um, opposite branch tree is the trees in the maple family. Um, we have a bunch of those, so <laughs> you might be looking at those. Um, and the branches of an, out, of an ash tree are very, very fat. They're like sort of fat fingers sticking out, whereas the maple tree can get a little more wispy at its ends. Um, so those stout, stout branches, stout opposite branches are a key feature along with the bark. 
We're going to fly through just a few more pictures should you still be looking next summer, which you hopefully are for ash trees. Um, you'll see the leaf is actually compound. There's a, there's a picture on the left there made up of leaflets between usually five and 11 leaflets. There's no, no rule. Um, and on the right, the female trees, female ash trees will have these samaras or these seeds that at a glance can also look a little bit like maple tree seeds, you know, the helicopters that you see falling down. But the ash trees come in single, single samaras, like a, like a pattern or something. A um, couple of lookalikes. And again, there's a lot more to say about looking at ash trees. And I hope that you can get out with your neighbors and county forester to go take a look. Um, box elders. Box elders are one of the easiest trees to mistake for ash trees. Their bark can be kind of furrowed as well. And in fact, box elder is part of the maple family, but um, it's sometimes called ash leafed maple because it looks enough like ash trees that people get confused. So don't feel bad if you're looking up and um, it's actually a box elder. The form is quite different. And remember the branches are not as stout. They become quite wispy. And um, the leaves do actually look a little different. They're, they're serrated along the edge. Um, but again, over this winter, it may be, may be hard to see. I'll we'll fly through just one more lookalike. Um, and I don't know what this will look like in, um, in Northfield, but Norway maple is definitely a maple <laughs> and its leaf is completely maple-like. But again, we're in winter. The bark here also looks furrowed and diamond shaped. Um, I'll have to ask Russ or, or someone to speak later about how likely you are to find Norway maples along your roadsides. Where I am in Montpelier, we do see them. And in the winter, um, it can be easy to confuse them with ash trees. So as we speed through our quick FAQ on um, emerald ash borer. So here, here's the beetle itself. It's actually kind of cool looking, but unfortunately very destructive in our environment. Um, depending on how big your screen is, you may be seeing a very large beetle in front of you. Um, but it's in fact about three eighths to half an inch long. Um, a little disruption upstairs, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, the beetle itself, again, is native to Southeast Asia. We're not exactly sure when it appeared in North America, except it was likely um, in, in the 90s, maybe the mid or late 90s, it was confirmed in 2002 in the Detroit area. And keep that in mind as we talk in general about emerald ash borer, that um, this is a, you know, emerald ash borer in North America is a new thing. It's a new pest and our research is less than 20 years old now. So as we start to think, what should we do ecologically? Um, you know, there's some things we know. Some, we know that the emerald ash borer kills um, sometimes 99% percent plus percent of ash trees in an area. Um, but the main thing to know is that there's still a lot to learn too. <laughs> and we're trying to understand particularly how it affects white ash trees, which may have a slightly higher survival rate than green and black ash, which are you know, the three species in our native in Vermont, white, uh, green, and ash. Um, but emerald ash borer has been known to affect all species of ash, ash in Vermont. Very quick summary of how EAB does its work. The adult beetle does indeed feed on the leaves, the canopy of the tree, but it's in fact the larvae, the, the little wormy white things that do most of the damage and, and ultimately kill the tree. They, um, the female beetle lays its eggs on the bark and um, the larvae end up hatching just and burrowing down into the cambium layer. And they make these tunnels that are S-shaped. They're very characteristic in ash trees. And you know, one or two of these is no big deal in the cambium layer, which is where the nutrients are, and water are flowing up and down. But um, once you get an infestation, these larvae make enough tunnels that they girdle the tree. They, they cut off all the nutrients to the tree. And um, that is ultimately what kills ash trees and kills them quite quickly. Um, they just don't, our native ash trees, which have not grown up, you know, evolved in concert with emerald ash borer, don't have native defenses to this. Some do, not many. <laughs> and we're still, again, it's only been 20 years, we're still trying to understand how, um, how resistant and how tolerant ash trees are, our native ash trees are to the emerald ash borer. So once the larvae, they do this amazing magic show um, when they turn from larvae into beetles and they ultimately burrow out as beetles, these green metallic beetles and fly away. 
um, to their next host spot, whether somewhere on the same tree or on a nearby ash tree. Here's a couple of the larvae, what they look like, and it's totally amazing that this does turn into a green beetle. But it's really those, there are many signs and symptoms of emerald ash borer in an ash tree, but it's really the, the confirmation of these larvae and their S-shaped galleries that tell, you know, tell a forest health specialist that yes, this is EAB in our tree. A couple of the signs, and I'll wrap up in the next three minutes or so to pass it on. Um, there are many, many reasons that people can think they see emerald ash borer in their ash trees. This is one of the most common reasons called woodpecker flecking, um, or sometimes known as blonding, where that remember that the larvae is just under the bark of the tree. And the woodpeckers know that. And so they start flecking off the edge of the bark to, um, to get the larvae. So if you see ash trees with deep, deep holes in them, the woodpecker is probably going for something else. <laughs> um, but the fact that they can go just under the bark is a sign that there's some emerald ash borer there in the tree. Ash also have many other native borers. So, you know, some of these signs and symptoms need to, it's, need to go hand in hand to eventually conclude that emerald ash borer may be the cause of ash tree decline. So a couple of those signs are canopy thinning. You know, one year your ash tree looks great and the next year it doesn't. Um, Bark splitting, you know, in some of these deeply infested trees, you can sort of reach your hand in there and pull off the bark and see, see the, the galleries right below the bark. Um, epicormic branching, which is sort of this last ditch attempt of the tree to form more leaves, but often lower down on the tree. Um, and that can be a, a sign that the tree is clearly stressed um, and, and may have emerald ash borer. Um, and these D-shaped exit holes, which if you've got very keen eyes, you would start to see um, the infestation often starts in the canopy layer of, you know, high in the canopy. So by the time you're walking down the street or down your, through your property and you see these, these exit holes, um, you can be pretty certain there's, there's a pretty severe infestation <laughs> in the ash trees there. And lastly, these, these S-shaped galleries, which you only see if the bark is coming off or if you use a draw knife. Um, to, to peel the bark off the tree and see those, which you know in itself is severely damaging to the tree. So you would never want to do that unless you have a particularly good reason and, and it's your tree. So it would um, definitely injure the tree there. Last thing is just sort of where EAB is in Vermont and what that means. You know, it, we estimate that in our Vermont forests, five to 7% of our trees are ash trees. Um, which still makes 160 million odd ash trees, um, white, green, and, and black. But in our urban areas, these are, these are street trees. Walk down uh, Main Street in Montpelier, they're all green ash. And um, in some cities already, they're doing a lot of inventories. And I know Northfield has done one too in the right of way. Um, you know, cities are, towns are looking at thousands of trees in their, in their right of way that once infested can die within five years. So if your road crew is maybe used to dealing with five or 10 risk trees a year, suddenly you may have hundreds. <laughs> and, and it's a very um, fast moving and destructive and expensive pest. So in our rural areas, um, in fact, I think Northfield, I wanna say Northfield is like one of the winners in the number of ash trees they have in the right of way, oh, like well, well over 3000 ash trees in the municipal right of way. <laughs> so it's quite a, uh, quite an ecological impact to, to have these trees decline prematurely and, you know, in the scheme of nature quite simultaneously. We know that EAB um, is transported by humans. You know, it flies at most one to two miles a year, which would take something like 200 years to fly from Detroit to Vermont, or 400 years, something like that. Um, but of course, we, we had it here within 15 or so. And um, it's been, like I said, it's been in all, around all our neighbors, um, but certainly firewood, ash lumber, even nursery stock, any wood product packaging um, that's not been heat treated in any way can harbor these larvae, which like, they're amazing. They can, um, they can live over winter in a piece of firewood for two winters. They can survive underwater for hours. Um, and the only thing that can really kill them is a heat treatment. Um, and it's certainly, you know, piggybacking in the, the back of a van that, that has spread it around the country um, within less than two decades, uh, kind of Colorado and East. This is my last slide, I think. Um, and this is 
the status of Emerald Ash Borer in Vermont as we understand it. I won't even say as of today, I think as of yesterday. <laughs> so um, what this map is, is showing is the center of these red circles are all confirmed infestation, whether that's a confirmed tree um, or a trap. Some of you might've seen the prism traps that hang purple or green. Um, and those are meant to attract EAB that are in the area and, and you peel the insect off and find them. The red is a five mile radius around that um, confirmed infestation. And the yellow is a further five miles, so five to 10 miles. And we call that the, the infested area. Sort of once you find it somewhere, you can be pretty sure that it's, that it's around that area. So I think I zoomed into Northfield here. You can see that you're a little bit sandwiched by um, confirmed infestation in Montpelier. And um, I think to the west, there's Bristol. There are some street trees there that are, have confirmed infestation and, and a chunk of Northfield there sits in the kind of that high risk yellow zone. And I'm sure you're looking for your road and your house. Um, and this is, you know, it's a very, very hard pest to detect. It's very humbling how hard it's been to detect and certainly worth considering knowing that it's on, on either side of Northfield that now is the time to be planning planning for that, <laughs> for emerald ash borer to be in our ash trees. So there's tons more to say, but I won't go on any longer, except to say that there's a lot of municipal planning and management, and um, that definitely applies to private landowners too. You know, there are same pests, different tactics, and um, a lot to think about as we cross into these next few years of ash tree management. So I will put these in a slide with kind of a PDF so you have them to review later some of the pictures and probably share them with Lisa. Good version. So I'll pass it to Dave, I think, or back to Russ. Russ, your call. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, thank you, Joanne. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit on uh, a little guidance for homeowners and the general public. Uh, but first, I'd like to go over uh, results of some ash inventory that we've done in Northfield over the last year or so. Uh, 3,742, that's the number of ash trees within the town road right of ways. Uh, for each ash tree, we have a uh, diameter, uh, a health condition, a removal priority and a GPS location. 6,755. That's the estimated number of ash trees on Payne Mountain Town Forest. Um, that was done through sampling, and we have good estimates on diameter and uh, tree conditions. 258. That's the number of ash trees within 20 feet of the Payne Mountain Trail um, on the Town Forest. That's on the lower 1.78 miles of the Payne Mountain Trail. Uh, quick homeowner's guide for EAB. Uh, number one, as Joanne said, uh, learn to identify your ash trees. If you have trouble with this um, and can't get a friend um, to help you out, you can give me a call, Northfield residents only, and I can come visit and help you out with your ash, ash uh, identification. A little repeat of what Joanne said, uh, learn the signs and symptoms of VAB. Die back of the foliage. Look for recent woodpecker activity. Insect galleries uh, under the bark. Sprouting of branches. Um, and the D-shaped exit holes. Um, and then you gotta decide what you wanna do with the ash trees you identified. Uh, at this time, the most likely scenario in Northfield would be your tree is probably not infested with EAB, uh, but EAB has been identified in nearby communities, which would be Montpelier. So, okay, if the tree is healthy and important to preserve, consider treatment using a professional arborist uh, approved for injection of the pesticide. The cost of that, um, we had some done in the village. Uh, $12 per diameter inch. Um, for example, if you have a 15 inch tree at $12 an inch, the $100, 100 
$1,000 to have that tree uh, treated. However, it will last approximately three years. So it comes out to $60 a year. Okay, if the tree is not important to preserve, consider removal and replacement with a different species. Remember the cost of removal may double over time as the tree's health and structure declines. Um, anybody who worked in the woods or with trees, dead trees with dead branches are very difficult to work with and very dangerous. The, the wood cut can be used for lumber, firewood, landscaping. Just be sure that no ash wood um, leaves the area in order to help slow the spread. Um, for the general public, I would say once again, just become aware of what the symptoms are. If you see any, report the damage uh, you notice. If you notice any, uh, we can report it to vermontinvasive.org, um, which is VT in capitals, invasive small letters.org, or you give me a call and I could pass it on. Um, next, I guess, Dave, we can uh, let you go. Thanks, Russ. Um, well, there's a, there's a lot that we could, could talk about. Um, as Joanne said, EAB was first found in uh, March of 2018, actually in the town of Orange. And uh, it was a consulting forester that, that found it. Uh, it was an area of, of uh, dead trees, uh, unhealthy trees with many that were dead. Uh, the thinking was the EAB had been there for several years, unknown exactly how many. Um, and immediately after, the Department of Forest and Parks did a survey of all the surrounding towns. And whenever we would find another ash tree that was infested in a different town, then we would do a survey of all the roads in all the towns around that town. And uh, we found it in four towns initially. So it was initially found in Orange. We did these surveys and we found it in Oh, I think it was Barry, Barry Town, um, Groton, and Plainfield. I think that's those were the other three towns, and um, and I found the the tree in. I mean, my crew that was that was doing the survey found the tree in Barry Town, and it was uh, as obvious as you could ever imagine. It had all the. It was just like Joanne's slide. Um, it had you know, woodpecker holes, it looked like it was, you know, probably had hundreds of woodpecker holes and actually had some of the bark knocked off to the point where you could, you could see galleries from the road in your car, you could see galleries. So it was just as obvious as could be. And, and what's, what confounds us is that the tree next to it, literally six feet away, another ash tree looked fine. And, and now it's been three full growing seasons. And I went back uh, last week and the tree next to it looks fine. So here you have a tree that's clearly infested, been infested for years. And there's another tree that you could all, literally almost touch both trees and it looks fine. And a lot of the trees in a lot of the ash trees that are within sight around this clearly infested tree three years after we found it, um, there begin, there's some, you can see that some of those trees are unhealthy. You don't see any symptoms, no, no uh, woodpecker holes, no blonding, no splits in the bark, just, just a general malaise. You can tell the trees are, some of the trees are not healthy, but if you didn't have that one tree that was a clear example, you'd never even think about it. And so, um, that, that brings up, you know, what we might find on, along our town roads or near our municipal biz, uh, buildings or public spaces um, or in our town forests or, or on our own private forest land. You, you will, if you go out into your forest, I can promise you that you will find some ash trees that look unhealthy and they may be unhealthy and they might be unhealthy for some other reason than EAB or they might have EAB and we can't tell. 
And it's the same thing along your town roads and it's the same thing along the edges of your cemeteries and near your town buildings and along power lines. And, and we, I think we need to treat these trees differently. If, they're, if, if we're starting to remove trees for safety reasons while they're still alive, we wanna focus on our town roads and any place where they create a potential safety hazard. Um, in the woods, they could hang on for quite a while. Um, these trees in, in Barrie Town have held on for quite a while. There, you know, there's no indication that, that they're going to die en masse. They may, you know, maybe next year they'll all of a sudden they'll turn some corner and, and there'll be mass mortality, but we're not seeing that. We're just not seeing it. So people often say, how long do I have? When, when, you know, there's EAB in the next town. When do I need to do something? We don't know. We really don't know. Um, you, you might find that you have a real problem uh, in a year or two, or you might have uh, a problem in 10 years. You're going to have a problem, but um, it, might be, it might be 10 years. We just we don't know. So uh, we've, we've heard stories from other places. And you know there was a there was a uh, speaker at one of our uh, forest health meetings that said in the first I think he said first five to six years after uh, you know the insect is there it's hard to find an unhealthy ash and then the second five to six years after that it's hard to find a live ash and so we're in year three and we've got plenty of live ash and not that many. In fact, infested trees that we know of. So, um, you know, that's, that's, I, we don't want to rush into anything. You don't want to rush into mass salvage in the woods, um, on your town forest, on your private land. You don't want to go way out of your way to just salvage all the ash uh, right now. There's no rush. Um, you have time. If you, if you're in current use and you have a <clears throat> you have a timber sale planned, probably makes sense. We're in Northfield being, you know, within the, the high risk area, which is the outer band of those circles that Joanne showed us. Um, about two thirds of the town of Northfield is in that high risk area and the rest of it is close enough that it may as well be. Um, so if you have a timber sale planned, you, you may want to uh, harvest a little more ash than you might have 10 years ago, doing the same, you know, doing the same work in the same place. Um, if it's if it's just a little bit more um, and it doesn't really change what you have planned, there's no need to amend your plan. If it's a mass salvage and it and it amounts to a different kind of a harvest than what you have planned in your management plan, then you do need to amend your plan. It's not something that's difficult to do. Um, but it is necessary to do it. The, the management plan is really a management agreement between the landowner and the state. And if the landowner decides to change the agreement, it's only proper that, you know, that the state gets a chance to review it before it happens. Um, if, you, uh, if you don't have a timber sale planned and you decide you're going to salvage your ash, you definitely need to file an amendment to your plan. And uh, most of the time we're, you know, we're, we're pretty agreeable. It's just that it's, it's something that you want to uh, be sure that you do so that there's no misunderstanding about what's happening or why it's happening. Um, I don't, I, I guess I don't have anything else. Uh, well, one other thing I wanted to mention when at the beginning of 2018, you know, at the very beginning in January, we didn't know we had any EAB. Now we have, by my count, uh, 21 confirmed EAB locations in Vermont. And, you know, the, that's 21 separate circles, some of them overlapping, so it's hard to exactly count them, but uh, they're starting to coalesce. And, um, and on the one hand, we need to pay attention to the fact that they're, you know, it's all around us and it's probably going to accelerate. Um, 
but at the other on the other uh, the other hand, we need to recognize that a lot of these 10 mile radius circles that we see on the map are one insect and might be really very little physical damage. So we don't want to we don't want to get too alarmed too quickly. I mean, we should be alarmed that the insect is here and that it's going to do the damage it's going to do, but it's not an emergency yet. Um, it's it's uh, at least in our forests, it's not an emergency. We have time to react and and be thoughtful and and do good work and not rush to to uh, cut all our ash trees down. So thanks. With that with that, I'm open to to questions or comments when it's time, and that's what I have. Thanks, Dave. Um, Lisa, do you have some questions for us that, that were sent in? There are a few in the chat box, and and um, I'm going to start off with one that um, I understand. You know, not just lingering ash they call it, or ash you know that are resistant to EAB. That that there is hope for our wood, so that we don't really have to run in there and take them all. And you know, not just that there will even be some that are resistant. So if we took them all, then we lose that component in our forests and there's not a chance of them coming back. And so my under, my understanding, and I just sort of want clarification, is that as a landowner, I shouldn't I shouldn't rush out and cut all my ash. I should really think about management and what my goals are and the ecological function of ash because it provides food for a lot of animals. And um, so just trying to think of all of that, if you could offer a little clarity. Who, who are you asking to do that? Uh, any one of you that want to jump in. <laughs> uh, maybe all three of you, maybe yeah. you have different answers. I don't know. You start, Dave. Okay, um, I can tell you what I what I see in, uh, in current use. I, being county forester, I review all the management plans in, in Orange County. And that's right now that's about 1500 um, parcels of land or 150 or 200 plans a year. So <clears throat> I see what people are planning to do. They're telling me in their plans and I see it over and over and over. And most landowners, if they have a timber sale planned, they're, they're revising their diameter objectives for white ash. So in the past, pre-EAB, they might have grown their white ash to be 18, 20, 22 inches in diameter because it can grow that big and be quite healthy and, and still be a, a vigorous tree. Now they've, if they have a timber sale planned and they know they won't be back into that place for 15 years, they know that's going to be too late. So they're taking the valuable ash. But that doesn't mean all ash. If, if they have a big tree that's not straight and valuable, they're leaving it. If they have trees that are 12 inches or 14 inches or 10 inches or 8 inches, they're leaving them in most cases. Um, most people are harvesting their ash that's good quality and 14 inches and up. That seems to be the pattern. And, and they're trying to maintain their stocking. So if ash makes up 10% of your forest, they're not taking an additional 10% in their timber sale. They're still taking exactly the same amount so that they have the same residual stocking. They're just choosing the ash over something else and leaving something that they otherwise would have cut. So that's, that's generally how people are treating it. And, and I very seldom see anybody making a sale just to get their ash. It's like they have an ash, they have a timber sale planned in two or three years. They plan to take the ash in two or three years. They're not going in this year and grabbing it. So that's, that's important to note. Nobody is, I don't see anybody doing that. Joanne, Russ, you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I, you go first, Russ. Joanne, go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll go ahead. Um, so I, I completely agree with everything Dave said and um, some things that I didn't even know about what um, people are choosing to harvest. You know, in our in our field, specifically in urban and community forestry, we're looking at trees that often have some kind of target. You know, it's the, a tree that's outside the school or over a power line, or it's the 
tree that shades your house from the southern or western sun and if it falls it will that, that you know there goes your kitchen it's kind of that type of of management is very targeted and specific to assess what the target is and what the risk is so some trees um may be large and vigorous and healthy and the town may decide it's it's time to address them now and you can address them through taking them down that is um a way to reduce the risk and also a definite way to kill a tree um but you can also choose to uh, treat it. Someone was just asking uh, about pesticide applications. Um, this, the, this is a very real and effective way to treat certain ash trees. Uh, we mean, Russ was saying how many thousands there are both on the roads and in, um, in the town forests. You know, it's, it's not effective for all the trees, but for some that have um, cultural, aesthetic, uh, economic, or, or you know, very environmental, real environmental benefits to the town, um, you can use insecticides to treat them. And generally that's, that can be you, you on your own private trees, but mostly that means hiring a certified pesticide, pesticide applicator who is hopefully also an arborist. Um, this is a trunk injection. It's, there's, there are holes drilled into the trunk of the tree and the pesticide is injected in in the, in the springtime. Um, so of course, if that's done incorrectly, it can also damage the tree. Um, but they're known to be very effective. I'm going to say like in the 90% effectives and also administered every two or three years. Um, so there are some real benefits to keeping ash trees standing um, because they offer, you know, a lot of a lot of services <laughs> to as shade trees, as items of beauty. Um, and then, you know, I would be remiss to leave out the cultural importance specifically of black ash. Um, and one of my questions for you, Russ, um, or others in Northfield who have been out on the roads a lot is thinking a little bit about, have you seen a lot of black ash? So again, we have three native species in Vermont, white and green. White um, in, North, in central Vermont, we see them a lot. I bet that's <laughs> what you have a lot of in your pro on your properties. The green ash are often these, um, street trees or planted trees, or, or you see them more in the Champlain Valley area. Um, black ash, they, they like very wet areas. You can have black ash swamps, um, but I've seen them in roadside ditches because those are wet and somehow they, they grow there. And um, for, the, for the Abenaki people, black ash trees are an important component of, of basket making and culturally imagining these trees not in the landscape anymore at all is, is very, very hard to stomach. And thinking now about where these trees are, where they grow, what environments they like, does give us hope to plan for some kind of future of ash in our forest, which will be um, probably beyond all our careers <laughs> in, a, in terms of time frame. Um, but there, are, there are really are so many reasons to take a look around and see what type of ash are growing where and what that might look like tens or even hundred years from now when we understand more about tolerance and resistance and biocontrols and all the sort of different layers that we're learning about regarding ash tree ecology in our area. Um, so yeah, lots of reasons to think about, about leaving them, um, but also some real reasons to think about public trees as, as, a, as an infrastructure. And if you know that many of them were fail, um, do you want to take them down? Do you want to treat them? Do you want to start planting? Um, maybe all of the above. So yeah, I'll pass, pass that over to Russ now for his reflections. I, I saw a question on there about uh, shipping logs. Dave, maybe you know more than I do now. Um, shipping from an infested area. Uh, can they go to a non-infested area or is all New England quarantined now so they can be pretty free to go where they want to go or just winter time or what? Oh, you're muted, Dave, if you're answering. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> we, we recommend that uh, uh, ash be shipped only in the non-flight season. Can be shipped in, in the flight season, but we would we ask people to try to ship in the non-flight season, which is October to May, uh, October through May. And um, 
the way you would do that is you, you can ship it to uh, an uninfested area, but you have to notify the, the uh, purchaser of the uh, origin of the logs. So you would, you would tell the uh, you would tell the purchaser that the logs are coming from an infested area, and then they would make special provisions. They would uh, uh, take the bark off, and if it was during the flight season, they would process that bark immediately. If it was uh, during the non-flight season, they would process the bark before the flight season, and they would saw the, the logs promptly. So they would keep the logs separately and, and saw them promptly. So um, you can still do it, but there are some uh, some good management practices to uh, to reduce the likelihood of spread. Um, as the as the value of the wood becomes uh, less, like you know something like firewood, uh, you really don't want to ship firewood out of an infested area to a non-infested area. Um, that's is you know especially to a homeowner. Um, because that's going to that's going to sit there for a while before they work it up, and um, those insects are likely going to come out, and, and you'll have another infestation. And and firewood isn't that valuable, and there's some there's local markets for firewood, so you know let's try to keep our firewood close to home. Um, and and I I also wanted to to mention something about uh, leaving residual ash, so. Even in places where people salvage their ash to try to get um, the money that's in in those ash trees, um, ash is traditionally a, a pretty valuable tree. It's about five to eight percent of our stocking statewide and con contributes about ten percent of value in timber sales. But people often overestimate the value. So if if you have a a pretty good sized tree, I don't have my scale stick in front of me, so I can't be exact. I'll be, I'll talk in generalities. But if you have um, a tree with three 10 foot logs, uh, it might have a couple hundred board feet in it. And if you were to get $200 a thousand in stumpage, that tree would be worth uh, $40. So if you were to leave in a timber sale, if you were to leave three or four you know, handsome ash trees on your property, uncut, just to see what happened, just because you like those trees, or 10 trees, you're not sacrificing a lot of money. It's not like they're $500 a piece or something, you know, so that's, that's just something to keep in mind. The, the price of keeping some ash in your woodlot, even if they die, is not, it's not a great loss. Great, thank you. Um, let me ask you another question. You know, Joanne, you mentioned biocontrols. Um, where are we at with biocontrols here in Vermont? Has there been a release of any of the beetles? I know beetles have been one of the, the controls that they've talked about. There have been, I believe, two releases of biocontrols in the state, um, both on state lands. And Dave can check me on this. Um, one is nearby in Plainfield. And at present, um, what we know about biocontrols are that there are a certain type of wasp, a parasitic wasp that feeds on the um, either the larvae or the eggs, I'm not sure, or, um, <laughs> of, of the of EAB. Um, we actually are starting to get a lot of questions from people, people like you who are curious about biocontrol sites, like would their forest be a good candidate for a biocontrol site? And our forest health folks are, are kind of working on answering frequently asked questions about that. Um, generally, for you to even consider releasing these parasitic wasps, the infestation has to be confirmed. Like there has to be something going on there. Um, there needs to be sufficient food for the wasps to see how it's controlled. Um, I think this year was the first year of the biocontrols that state of Vermont has tried. Do, do you think that's correct, Dave? I think so. I think so. And you're right about the two sites. One was South Hero and the other was Plainfield. 4,500 insects at each site. And they were uh, wasps that parasitized the larva. And there are, there are two kinds of wasps that are available to us. Uh, two that parasitize the larva and one that parasitizes the eggs. 
and next year they're going to release all three at I guess at those same sites. How soon will they think they might see an effect of those? What's the uh, what have they seen elsewhere? Or what are they anticipating? I don't know. I don't really know yet. That was one of my questions just recently. Was you know how, can they tell yet? Is it working? <laughs> and um, and I don't think we know in Vermont quite yet. And again, like the study of how these biocontrol wasps like tactics are working. Is, is very nascent. <laughs> so um, certainly as a overarching um, theme to leave ash trees up, you know, it could be five years from now, we have a very different story of how, how we know these work. At, at present, it's not something like you or I could go onto Amazon and order. Like it's, it's a fairly controlled um, process, but it will be really interesting to, to think, you know, knowing that what 70, 80% of our forest is privately owned how can private landowners start to weigh in and say like, I think I've got a great site. I think like this is what's going on and it would, it would be great to try that here. Um, I think that that's kind of an important element of citizen science that we'll move towards. There's a, a group I'm working with um, for New England involving some of the um, Forest Guild members um, and some of the researchers putting together 10 steps for landowners. Uh, to think about when they're thinking about managing their ash. So all the landowners online here should stay tuned for that. It's not done yet, it's, but they're working on, we're working on that. So that's kind of exciting. Um, I have a question um, relating to sort of like the wave of EAB, right? You know, we expect this sort of like, you know, progression, we're gonna have a lot of them sort of like gypsy moths. And now we've learned to live with gypsy moths. And yes, we have bigger outbreaks, but it's not, devastating and, and so overwhelming to our forest. Is, is that the anticipation or hope for EAB? Probably no. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're, 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 yeah, there will be, um, you know, low level EAB infestation that then grows quickly um, and followed, you know, a peak that's followed by ash mortality, essentially, you'll see a lot of ash die fairly quickly altogether. Um, and that at which point you would hope that the ash are dead. And so the EAB are starved out, essentially, <laughs> that, that there's nothing left to eat. Um, ash trees are, are prolific sprouters at times, <laughs> they require certain conditions, but they can certainly, um, you know, pop up either from stump sprouting or, or, or through their own germination. But we're finding that EAB will infest trees as small as an inch in diameter. Um, so that means that there's sort of this constant food source <laughs> coming. And what we've seen so far in, in the Midwest is that despite there being a peak of EAB population that it, it, it then lowers down, but it persists in the landscape. There's enough ash around <laughs> to, to um, sustain a base level population of EAB. Um, we, there was some efforts to try like to create sort of a, a, a dead zone around a new infestation, a new infestation, you know, taking down the ash trees or I don't know, a mile radius or something like that um, in hopes of starving them out, which, which has worked with other insects, but it has not worked with, with emerald ash borer. Well, one other thing that goes on is that the, uh, when the infestation wave rolls through, it, it doesn't touch every place. So um, ash will suffer mass mortality, but there will be islands that for whatever reason don't suffer mortality. Or they may be infested, but for whatever reason they don't, you know, a high proportion of the trees don't die. So that matters because um, they'll still produce seed. And so even though in the first wave, most of the mature ash trees will die, there will be some that will um, survive that first wave and still produce seed. And then, you know, there's all the ash regeneration that exists in our forest. You know, it's probably billions of trees and, um, and they'll grow. And, you know, while EAB may infest trees down to one inch, it won't get every one inch tree. And some of those trees will grow to the point where they can seed and will prolong ash for a while. And we don't know how long, but um, hopefully 
you know, through the bio controls and, and woodpeckers get a lot of them and woodpecker populations will increase. And, and it's, it's not hopeless, it's not hopeful, but it's, <laughs> we're, not, uh, we're not giving up on ash. It's possible that, that ash could be with us in some reduced form uh, for, for a while, you know, decades perhaps. So what I'm hearing is that it's going to be rough, but there's hope. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, we'll, and we'll find, you know, some ash that survived that first wave, either because they got lucky. I mean, they just happened to be in a place where EAB didn't go, or they did have some kind of tolerance or even outright resistance. Um, you can certainly think about um, hybridizing those trees that show some resistance uh, with Asian varieties. You know, there there is... I'm, I'm hopeful <laughs> yeah, that there's some future, but it won't look at all like the present, um, which is sort of a common theme we hear a lot these days with all kinds of things, but it's, um, it's, it's definitely, the, the more we can find out now about how ash are, you know, noting now how ash are growing, um, particularly in like unique places uh, natively, the, the better we can hopefully regenerate that one day in the future. And again, it, it may be when we're not working anymore, but um, there, there's a lot of neat information to find out. And you, you can even find that out by going out on your property. Now you know what you're looking for. Um, you start to see patterns of how common ash trees are or, or not. <laughs> and, and noting that, um, or even making some tough decisions to, to treat them with insecticide and preserve them or take them down because they, they are a risk or you want to harvest them. It's all, um, it's all great information to, to find out now, better now than five or 10 years from now. <laughs> well, that's a great way to wrap up. I'm gonna pass it off for, to Russ for any last minute um, announcements from the Conservation Commission. I will say we are planning the um, Conservation Commission, you could talk more about it, uh, Russ, um, but they're planning a January EAB uh, program as well, really focusing on, I believe, the woodlot management. Uh, Russ? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. And I um, first I want to thank the, the speakers uh, and the people who attended tonight. Um, we are talking about a, a, a plan forum on January 13th, uh, primarily aimed at woodlot owners and maybe get into more about markets, uh, get a good uh, explanation of the quarantine. Uh, UVA specifics, uh, harvest timing, uh, log shipping, and, and, and so forth. Um, but that's about it as far as I'm concerned. And once again, thank everybody. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we will post this online on Covert's YouTube channel. So if you want to share it with any neighbors or friends, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if you're not already signed up for the Covert's e-newsletter, you can do that on our website to hear about programs just like this and other uh, great facts about our woodlands and wildlife here in Vermont. And we wish you all a wonderful evening and a great weekend. And for those who are heading in the woods next week for deer season, good luck. Thanks, Lisa.